All righty, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We have a very special guest today, uh, someone that has not only made a name for herself in the trading industry, but has gone above and beyond when it comes to understanding markets, traders, and just how to be a high performer. She is a, a veteran in the markets and a leader in the world of trading psychology. She's also an author of Freud's Path to Profits, a consultant for Showtime's uh, episodes Billions, and the founder of the Rethink Group, an organization that has helped high performers to perform even higher, to giving you a new meaning of this is my peak. She is an amazing person overall. We have Miss, Miss Denise, or doctor correct no not doctor. doctor oh not doctor my bad i gave Miss up the doctor to start trading ha, you see that there you go ladies and, and for our doctors out there as well maybe not always worth it but still miss denise <laughs> show here thank you for coming on thank you for spending some time with us to really help us get a deep dive into what what makes a trader tick and what you found over the years that has led you to be such a success as well within the markets and within your consulting. So let's start. Let's start with that. As far as the the brain science that is it, it, helping traders make a decision, can can we give the audience a ten thousand foot overview of that, and then we'll break our way down? Yeah. The bottom line is never say take the emotion out of it again, because if you did, if you literally could, which you can't, it just seems like you can you wouldn't be able to make a decision. So like this has been known for more than 20 years. There's a book called Descartes' Error by Antonio Damasio. And Descartes, you know, famously said, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And Damasio, who's a neuroscientist, was saying, I feel, therefore I am. So like the only thing you have to control are your actual actions, you know, like what you do. And you need to start thinking of your feelings and emotions as information. So I can bury you all with science. I was just telling you we're moving and I finally decided to throw away paper copies of scientific studies that, you know, in the early 2000s, showing you have to have emotion to make a decision, that all decisions are based on emotion. So, but the world just doesn't know it yet. And we were talking about analogies. I think it's like a flat earth, round earth thing. You know, back when people thought the earth was flat because it looks flat, right? Because that's what they could see. But sort of the same with emotions and decision making. We see that when we get really emotional, more so than normal, we tend to act it out. We tend to behave on it, behave as a result of it. So we say the problem is the emotion. It's actually not. The problem is the behavior and how the emotion is just acted out. The emotions actually have information from intuition, unconscious pattern recognition, which is just a sense, right? A mild feeling to like enraged, which is, you know, a strong feeling that will urge you to act, but it's still better to try to tolerate it and choose, analyze. So like that's the cornerstone of everything I've taught. We teach it, rethink that I figured out <laughs> Way back when, I mean, when I was trading, you know, in the 90s, basically, and running trading desks in the early 2000s, I read all the trading psychology that's take the emotion out of it, take the emotion out of it, take the emotion out of it. Um, and I had good instincts for the market. And I could follow a plan because I'm fairly disciplined and organized. But still, like, you know, I had my moments like everyone does. Like, why did I do that thing again? You know, well... As it turns out, it really is just a total misunderstanding of how thinking, feeling, emotions work together in making a decision and, and acting on it. Um, uh, something that I use within the markets when I'm working with individuals on a one-to-one -one is it's how we choose to receive, perceive, and then act upon the information being presented to us. Given the time and the amount of individuals you've worked with, what would you say is one of the key aha moments to realizing that you're always going to have emotion, but I can do these things to 
curb the way I act upon that emotion. I've, I've instructed some people before to use a tactile response. Uh, an example being three red sticky notes, three green sticky notes. When you make one trade, move one over. You've made a tactile action to what you saw going on. In your opinion, what, what are some of the... Um, the courses of action, a newer to moderate trader that may have made a career before can go about now going, OK, I want to have a thesis, a trading plan. What's something they can do to curve those emotions? Well, I'm again going to say what they want to do is choose the action that makes them the most money. And the best way to choose the action is to know truthfully and accurately what they're feeling and why they're feeling it. And then once they're like amassing this data set on themselves, which I sometimes call like build a dictionary on yourself, hmm, you wanna like become that. more, um, you wanna become better at knowing sort of what sort of feelings and emotions are intuitive or informational and which are impulsive or irrelevant. And so like the latter might be, you know, a feeling about your dog that went to the vet or, you know, your teenager who's being a pain or whatever. I mean, it's, it's not an irrelevant emotion to your life, but it's an irrelevant emotion to the trading decision. I see. I see. Separating, separating home and work life, so to say. Well, and uh, yes, I mean, you could put it that way, but it can be anything, right? It could be the last trade, right? Yes. Your, your feelings about the last trade have literally nothing to do or should have nothing to do with the decision you ultimately make about the next day. Now, you know, feelings will bleed from one situation to another. But like, I literally think the first thing people have to do is decide to change their mind about their senses, feelings, and emotions. Now, senses, feelings, and emotions are all physical experiences, just degrees of intensity. So like, you know, you have a sense of something that's right or wrong or a sense of the thing you should do. And by the way, the more of an expert you are, the more sense about the right thing to do you have in any field, any field, even mathematics. Like you have a sense of the right math to apply to some complex problem. Why? Because you have a whole bunch of education and expert and experience. It creates a sense of when we first learned something, I mean, think about riding a bicycle. You know, when you first learned, you had to like balance, you know, put your hands on the, you know, and move your foot forward and hope that you didn't fall. Well, now you just hop a bike. And it went from like a cognitive, conscious, linear, do this, do that, step one, two, three, four, five, to knowledge that's in your body. It's called felt intelligence, visceral intelligence, felt knowledge, totally valid regardless of what the behavioral finance people say. <laughs> yeah. The skill though, is to learn to know that physical sense versus some urgent need to act because you're up, upset about the last trade, you're afraid you'll miss out on this trade, some feeling that's really about you, not about the market. Interesting, interesting. And I love how, a lot of, well, let's use John Ehlers for an example here and many other people that have ran mathematics and their field of mathematics around putting indicators onto there to measure the, I'll say sentiment of the market for lack of a better term here. Have you found yourself as you work with people going through it, be it uh, John Bollinger or anyone like that, that we try to make sense of the world through indicators, but at the end of the day, it seems they're all reading from relatively the same data set and they're just, they're basically all on the same canvas, but they're trying to use a different pen to see the same thing. Um, is that a, a good way to approach things or a bad way? Or maybe is that a way to try and chain the idea of emotions within this? Like you said, there's always going to be some form of emotion. It's how we choose to work with that emotion through the market and make that choice overall. What do you think as far as people trying to use so many different paintbrushes on the market, even though we all have pretty much the same data set? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I was going to say you need confidence or conviction to actually take the trade and that's the feeling you're looking for. But it's, it's kind of funny that you bring this up. So it, it, I'm going to say step back and think about what this game is. You know, it's not poker. 
it's like poker, but it's not poker. There's no absolute meaning to the hand, right? It's definitely not chess where there's a, a literally a finite number of possibilities. It is predicting how other people are going to interact with that market data. So, you know, I have quite a few hedge fund clients and actually a big long only fund that's only ever buying stocks and holding them forever. So, you know, what what could they do? You know, they look at company fundamentals and projected cash flows and valuations, and they say, you know, out 18, 24, 36 months, this stock should be worth this. But what are they really saying when they say this stock should be worth this? They're saying other people will think this stock should be worth this, so they'll be willing to pay that price. So that's called theory of mind. We have a theory of the other person's mind. That has been shown to be the X factor of trading skill. There was a super cool experiment done at Caltech in 2007, where ultimately they showed that like natural born trader thing where people could just read the market. What they were using inside their head was their ability to predict other people. And they were not using math in any way, shape or form. Now, Interesting. We've all seen people who are really good at reading the tape. I mean, when I first started trading, there were a couple of guys I was trading with and they'd be like, can't you see what they're doing? And there'd be this huge bid and they're like, oh my God, sell it. And I'd be like, wait, what? And they're like, you know, the specialist, there used to be one guy at the New York Stock Exchange. You know, he's like, specialist is trying to fake you out, you know, because he's got like too many sellers and he needs other people to come. I'm like, what? You know, it made no sense, but they understood the market in terms of this people perception, this people game, which is like how people play poker. You know, you play what you think other people are playing. It's just a little bit different than the market because at the end of the day, that cards do mean the same thing. But the idea that poker players are trying to suss out with other people. So that thing, theory of mind, is what indicators are really trying to indicate to you. Moving mm-hmm. averages, you know, rate, volatility ranges, pick any of them. I mean, my, one of my favorite is market profile because it does tell you the volume that traded at a given price. So you can mm-hmm. say, well, you know, you know that many more people care about that price versus that price. So you can sort of expect something to happen. But it's all aimed at like, if you could just know how other people are going to think, you know, about a stock or a future or whatever you're trading in five minutes or five weeks or five years, whatever your time frame is, that's all anybody is trying to predict. And every method, whether it's you know fundamental cash flow analysis or short-term technical analysis, is, is actually trying to tell you that. So it's good to know that that's what you're really looking for. And to never forget that you're you're not trading the indicator, you're not trading the you know expected valuation, you're trading how other people perceive those things. So if you remember that, it can like one thing it can help you do is get out of a loss when you're sort of fighting yourself and you kind of know you should, but you don't really want to. And you're rationalizing. Like if you remember that this is like, you know, a bunch of other people. And right now the bunch of other people are selling against your long position. It can it can actually tap into your own need to protect yourself and say, okay, I'm not going to try to fight this, you know, crowd of people coming at me. Where if you're just using the indicator, you might go, well, I still have a little space, you know, you know, you like and rationalize, even though you know. Um, but the bottom line is like, what are other people thinking? Theory of mind. We actually have an intuition brain game based on that ex- that experiment on our website, um, which is practicing getting the sense. Because this is the thing, all human beings have a theory of mind skill. You have to have it. Like a place that you use it is driving, or I used to live in New York City, walking down the street in New York City. <laughs> you know, you're unconsciously predicting, you know, or you just can feel that someone's coming, you know, you're about to, to move over into the left lane and you can just feel that someone's coming. Like that's theory of mind, you know, or planning how you are going to weave through traffic that you're using theory of mind. So we all have it. And if we remember, that it's a primary skill of reading the market, we can get better at tapping into it. And oh, by the way, it's delivered as a sense through our body. It, you know, 
I like that. You know, and that goes into, I, I've told people this for years. I want, because I did like every other trader beforehand, 50 different indicators. Let me do this, that, and the other. And that actually was my aha moment. I, I believe it was um, the one thing by Gary Keller. What is the one thing I can do to make everything else either obsolete or more efficient? And that's when I started to realize, wait a second, all of these indicators are from the same data set and I'm not trading markets. I'm trading people. I'm not BlackRock. I'm not, I'm not front point. I'm not blah, 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 all the way through. I'm trading these people on this time frame for this specific right. event right. and then sectorize the market. Given your skill set, and you mentioned the brain game, uh, I believe that's on the Rethink website, correct? Yeah. What is a way some, even veteran traders could go about sharpening that theory of mind idea, that idea overall of, okay, well, now that I know that this is a concept, how can I hone myself on that concept? For, for me, it's just been hours upon hours upon hours on the charts, but are there better ways to actually hone that skill? Yeah. Well, one you mentioned is really is take, take things off your screen. You know, we put things on the screen to help increase our certainty, but if you think about it, all it does is add like exponential levels of more combinations. Everyone makes so it complex. It, yeah. So it ironically creates less certainty, not more certainty, or you can always find something on your screen to justify whatever you want to do. Uh, um, bias, self-bias. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But another thing is literally like it, particularly if you're a short term trader is to look at all your indicators, like look at your screens. Don't be doing anything. Walk away and come back in five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And before you come back, tell yourself where that market's going to be. Hmm. You'll be shocked how right you are. That that reminds me of an old drill uh, for it was using a TPO volume profile on there, and um, it was called the cut and run drill. Place a place a trade, and then say, okay, I'm going to leave this trade here. 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to come back. I'm going to do one of three things: add the position, close the position, or do nothing based on this information. And uh, that that is something I've applied to people for that over trading. It seems a lot of people. We were talking with an individual earlier today that. So many people feel that they have to be in a trade. Ah, yeah, see, the same thing. What's, uh, what's you, when you hear, uh, let's say a new manager, a hedge fund manager is coming on, they just opened up a fund, they're getting ready, they have a system and process together, but they've got new people on the desk and they go, hey, I've got to be in a trade, I've got to be in a trade. What's your, uh, what's your answer for telling people, you really don't have to be in a trade all the time. Even scalpers know when to not be in the market. What's your answer for that? Like if you're a professional athlete, you want to be able to play when you're as much as you can at your physical peak. If you're a professional athlete, you don't play the whole game like on a team, right? Yeah. Um, if you're a snowboard racer, for example, because we have one on our team who just won two gold medals, um, you know, she does a race, takes a break. You know, it, it's 20, 30, 40 minutes, two hours before she has another heat. So there's the literal physical energy piece of it. And your results are not just from whatever the statistics are of your system, if you even have them, but your results are the, you know, the expected value, expected probabilities of your system and your ability to execute. It's a real, it's a joint probability of those two things. And so you can optimize your own ability to execute. You can't do anything about the market, but you can do something about yourself. You can, like, if you're tired, you will not see risk. You won't just take more risk. You'll look back and go, what was I thinking? Like, oftentimes when people call me up with some sort of crazy trade they did, the first thing I say is like, how did you sleep? You'd be surprised the percentage of time that the answer's not very well. You know, the baby was up, the dog was sick, whatever. I got up at, you know, 3 a.m. to check the London Open. <laughs> so like, don't trade tired. You know, it, you're gonna, your, your risk perception is going to be skewed. So you have to think of it like an athlete that you, you want to be in your best mental physical shape to see the market as well as you can. That 
will get you the best results over time. I mean, this myth of you have to take every trade, I, you know, I mean, I certainly heard it in the 90s when I read the trading psychology books. You know, there was this idea that you had some approach to the market and you knew the statistics were this. And so the statistics would only turn out to be that if you took every single trade. It's only true if you're a computer, if you can take every trade in the same way. If you're a human being where the quality of your execution is going to vary depending on your energy, your mood, what you're feeling, the fact that you think you're supposed to take the emotion out of it, but you're really gonna trade on the emotion, it's gonna vary. So work with that. And then over time, your results will be better. Like another thing I say related is like, you don't wanna be trading when the market's not really doing that much. It's like an exercise in frustration and an exercise in losing money. But you wanna feel good and be energized when it starts, when the speed and rhythm are something that you understand and makes us, makes sense in terms of however you see the market. So by the way, it's going to make me also say, everyone needs to rationalize how they see it, how they understand it. What is it? How does it work? Sit down on a Saturday afternoon with your feet up, you know, on a picnic table and say, what is it? If I had to explain this to a third grader, explain what it is, how it works, how you make money, like, could I do it? And do I believe it? Because what happens to a lot of people is they start trading, they learn from someone, and then they struggle. So they go to learn from someone else. So then they go to learn to someone else. And they never really like figure out for themselves. What is this thing, the market? How does it work? What makes it move? How do I interact with it? What do I believe in? Like my long only, you know, $15 billion funds. Like they, they believe in, you know, cash flow and, and future valuation. Like they do. That guy actually happens to look at charts for his actual entries and exits. But I mean, he can, he can withdraw, he can stand great drawdowns because he believe, really believes. So like people skip over this, what do I believe about oh the market? God. And they don't necessarily develop confidence in like their way of seeing it. So I'm going to go back to when I first started trading, just to give an example. So when I very first started, I was in, a, in an office called Electronic Trading Group in Chicago. It was one of the first upstairs trading firms. And they just like any floor trader who wanted to come upstairs and trade. So we had all sorts of different styles. I had a scalper in front of me. I had a guy doing uh, mergers and acquisition arbitrage to the left of me. I had a guy that ran the office, just tra- he was 10,000 up on utilities and he didn't care when he got hit. And like he'd have bids and offers in all the time. And like, he never watched the market. And I started watching it and I sort of thought, you know, things move together. Like I started to feel this sense of momentum mm-hmm. and that started to make the market make sense to me. I would see industry groups move together like the drug stocks. Mm-hmm. So I left that place and went to Schoenfeld, which traded momentum. And literally industry groups moving up and down together by the ones that are going up and short the ones that are going down. That works for me, still works for me. You know, then when I met my husband, who was a former Federal Reserve economist, and when I first opened Barron's and was talking about charts, he was looking at me like, you nuts. Um, but I got him interested in options and he can't see a trade unless it's, you know, whatever, iron condor. <laughs> <laughs> All of he's a spreads guy. Yep. He's a spreads guy. Now it makes sense to him that way. It does not make sense to me that way. I mean, I, I can, I know what he means, but like, I either just want to be long or short. Like, I don't care. You know, I, I, um, so I started on that little soliloquy on what do you believe? Like, how does it make sense to you? I mean, there's a zillion ways to do this. There's no one right way. Like there's the way that makes the game make sense to you, your confidence, your belief in your confidence, which will help you in the moments that you're like, you know, you get back to like whatever your core way. You know, and and that brings up a, a very important aspect of things is like you said, building a dictionary on yourself um, over the years, uh, I'll presume that you have journaled to figure out things here and there. Have you found a 
best way to incorporate an emotional journal with a PL journal, an action journal. Uh, for me, I used to work in the classic automobile industry. And what we would do is the last 15 minutes of the day, what we would do is go through, okay, I achieved this goal. I did this thing. This is what I've got to do later on. As my trading developed, I actually put together a grid graph with the classic smileys. Okay, what was my general emotions for this day? And then over a six month period, took that data set, threw it into a model and went, okay, well, what do I do? And I found out, I'll be quite frank, I suck between taking trades from 1130 to one. And if there's no catalyst, just my emotions, maybe I was hungry, maybe it was something going on. But when I looked at the data set, almost consistently, my emotions were off and my results were completely off from 1130 to one. So I made it a rule for myself, no trades from 1131, because statistically, me personally, I'm at a disadvantage. Have you found anything like that or a best practice for newer to medium traders to journal their aspects? I'm going to reference one other thing before I actually say anything about journals. When I was at Schoenfeld, which is the was the largest day trading office in the late 90s, huge. I mean, they still exist, but um, as day traders, we were not allowed to trade from 11 to 1.30 Chicago time. There you go. Why? Yep, slow because period. the market chops around during the day and like the odds are just not that great. It was great. And I loved it, by the way, because I would like leave the office, go work out, come back. And it was like two completely different days. Now, OK, so back to the journals. <laughs> uh, it's funny that you asked that because literally in my throwing out old papers yesterday, I came across old printouts of my journals. Ooh. Um, <laughs> and I was like, should I keep these? Oh, my gosh. Like. I kept some of them, but um, so I use OneNote. I still recommend that people use one, Microsoft OneNote, which, and I would just like freeform, like paragraph, this trade for these reasons, got in here, got out there and talk about how I feel. And then the thing I like about OneNote is you can create, um, I don't know what they're called, icons or, you know. Little bullet symbols. areas, yeah. So you can create... A, all the symbols that you want. I mean, they have them in there, but you like, like a green star, you know, would mean, you know, traded that well, for example, you know, or a red question mark would be, you might want to think about what happened there. And so I just write what I'm doing in the trade, freeform how I'm feeling, put some symbols on it that I custom design. And then you can pull it, which it sounds like sort of similar to what you did. You can pull all your symbols, at which point you have kind of a chart on yourself. Now you'd have to go, you know, put a number to it to put it in the spreadsheet and come up with a, you know, arithmetic calculation, but that could be done. But you could see at the end of the week, like, you know, what just qualitatively, you know. This is my I time still period. Yeah. 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 I still recommend people do that. I mean, I had like the, but I know better trade, which I ended up talking about once I started talking about trading psychology, um, you know. I'll have another ice cream Sunday trade or I'll have another martini trade, um, which is, that was really fun. Let's do that again. And then you're like, what did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was talking the other, uh, on the last election, me and some friends got together. And for some reason we thought it would be a great idea to all go buy a, uh, our favorite bottle of whiskey and trade the futures during election. Horrible idea. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Horrible idea overall. Somehow we all made money and, that that spirals into the aspect of making money when you do not an end, intend to overall. Have you found traders that they go, yes, I made money, and then you have to correct them or speak with them about, okay, well, you made money, but you went completely against your thesis. When I see a trader do this, yes, you made money, but you built a bad habit or at least put a building brick in the bad habit aspect of things. Have you seen many traders do this before as far as make money on a bad trade? Well, what people do is, I mean, if you take that kind of up a couple letter levels, what you're doing is you're judging your performance just on your P&L. And while your P&L is obviously what you're trying to accomplish, you know, like, and if you're an athlete, you're trying to win the game. And at the end of the day, p l are winning the game are the only things that count. But there's a whole bunch of ingredients that go into p l are winning the game. And so you really want to judge yourself on the ingredients, you know, or as 
many hedge fund people say, and many athletes say, and the equivalent is, you know, plan the trade, trade the plan, have a process, follow your process. That's what you want to judge yourself on. You know, do I have a process, a plan that I believe in and how well did I follow it? Now, I'm just going to make it more complicated for the fun of it. In the end, if you're, if you get really good at this, it's not following the process or the plan a hundred percent of the time. You make the slight adjustments. Yeah, because it's like, you know, the best, the only sports that it's remotely like are sailing or surfing, where you're reacting to the wind or the waves, you know, with your skill and like you want to stay upright. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, and, you know, or there may be a gust of wind or a wave that you can catch. And when you're an expert, like, yeah, you have your specific plan, but you want to be able to adjust on the fly. Mm-hmm. Now. You know, you don't want to do that when you're brand new at it, right? You want to you want to be developing a process, creating a plan that you understand, that you believe in, that you have confidence in, so that you can trade out of that confidence. Which, by the way, going in a way to the next level, you know, you're always going to move back and forth in some sort of spectrum of confidence to fear that fear, anxiety, and doubt. Like fear, anxiety, and doubt aren't necessarily bad. You just need to know back to what I said at the beginning, what am I feeling and why? Like what's the fear and uncertainty doubt about? You're always going to feel uncertain because it's the future and it's the market and anything can happen. And unlike sailing or surfing, you know, all of a sudden a storm can just drop right in out of nowhere. It was not in the radar and there it is. Um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt or anxiety and doubt, it doesn't mean you automatically get out. It means like, what's it really about? You know, is it just about waiting for this trade to work out? Or is it that little tickle that you can tell something is going wrong vis-a-vis whatever your reason for the trade was? And is that feeling that something's going wrong actually intuition based on your experience, you know, and your accumulated expertise or just, you know, fear of what it'll do your p yeah. So we're back to the dictionary on yourself. What do different senses and feelings mean to you? I mean, I have professional portfolio managers who work for huge companies that you've all heard of, who have been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, who I end up working with them all the time on just believing themselves and not acting on their fears necessarily. Yeah, I think that that's very important. So, um, here at my fund, when I'm doing things, I, I have clients that they've actually sent me emails and said, hey, I'm trying to trade my accounts like you. And I go, well, that's not why you're part of the fund, but okay. I'll send out the monthly report and I love getting those back because they're trying to measure themselves to what I'm doing. What can you speak on as far as we all have to hold ourselves to a standard? Yes, but it seems so many new beginning and even medium traders are trying to hold themselves to the, the likes of Dalio to uh, Simons to accept. And it's just unreal. I mean, a, a first year grad student is not going to have anything over a, or they may have a little bit, but over a 15 and 20 year veteran within the industry. Uh, what can you speak about people setting unrealistic measures for themselves as they're getting into the trading? Well, again, you know, it's like, what does it take to be a professional athlete? People don't decide they're going to be a professional golfer and go out like next year and be a professional golfer. You know, time and time and time. People put years and years and years of experience, you know, and as far as Renaissance tech, like go read The Man Who Solved the Market by Gregory Zuckerman and look at the years. Great book. Great book. Yes. And you know what? You know, the reason I love that book the most, and I rarely read a book cover to cover because they end up boring me and at some point in the middle I stop. But that one I read cover to cover because. All they like, you know, they've had 60% returns, these insane numbers, but why? Because they went back and got every bit of market data that existed in all of history. All back to the tulip crisis. Yep. And analyzed how prices move. And then they built algorithms to trade the patterns they saw. But like one of the patterns was things that gap down in the morning, fill the gap. Like things that... Every trader is seen, but Renaissance technology proved it to themselves. So they believed it. 
So they could trade, their computers could trade it like clockwork. But why? Because they, they believed in their program. And if you read through that book, you can see all kinds of things that as a trader, you know. So they weren't any smarter than the average person. The thing that they were so smart about is Jim had worked in the computer industry in the 80s, like at the Department of Defense, if I remember correctly. Like he had the idea that he could apply massive computing power to proof and belief. That was their genius, not the actual patterns they came up with. I mean, I'm sure they have, you know, insane patterns that people who haven't been able to analyze all of market data don't know about. But still, so many are listed in that book that I was like, I saw that in the 90s. I knew that in the 90s. I just never occurred to me to imply all the computing power I could possibly amass to prove that it existed. You know, um, so I don't know what got me off on that rant. Oh, um, Tony Turner, who used to be a consultant kind of in the psychology of trading. I remember her saying, if you're smart, it will take five years. And if you're really smart, it's going to take 10. Yes. So <laughs> yes, like, because you do, I mean, I've seen super smart people. I mean, in the, in the independent trading world, I mean, obviously I have some super smart people who, you know, got themselves into an analyst and a hedge fund and now run a hedge fund. And that's a certain career path um, that takes a certain amount of intelligence, but, you know, sometimes if you're so smart and you're used to be able to figure something out, this is just a completely different game. Yeah. I, some of my hardest one-on-ones uh, -on -ones, clients that I work with, uh, people in the community as well, engineers, doctors, people that are very analytical by nature, but then we get the classic analysis paralysis on things and, okay, well, I have this brick and mortar system here. It's got to work exactly like this, but as we described, surfing, sailing, et cetera. You have to have a little bit of flexibility and intuition with with the markets to, in my opinion, to be moderately to ultra successful overall. I mean, yeah, it just gives us the ticks. Anyone can, especially in a bull market, I mean, you can throw a dart and just about hit anything. But uh, me personally, I agree with the aspect of the traders that have a system and survive a bear market and know when to walk away. Again, the 11 to 130 aspect there, know when to walk away are the people who become long-term traders. Is that a fair presumption or am I off tilt with that? Well, people see what happens is people get the feeling that trading is like an algebra problem hmm. and that somewhere there is the, you know, X equals Y divided by six or whatever. And they, they don't realize they feel that way, but they do. And so they keep looking for some like precise answer. <laughs> and it's so not they, there. It's yeah. not there. It like doesn't exist. It's literally not the game. It's I not like the it. game. So if you go back to what is the game, like the game is predicting how other people are going to react to prices in some time frame that is the one that you're comfortable with how other people are going to react to information about the prices in that time frame. So we're back to theory of mind. So all those indicators and all those pieces of analysis, you know, there are clues, they are clues, but that's all they are. They're like clues to a mystery, but they're not the answer. You know, if you're an engineer, you expect the engineering answer. If you're a doctor, you expect the test to tell you what the problem is, you know, Biology is still quite mysterious, but you know, it's still, a, there are a lot of things about biology that we can say it works like this, where the market, you know, I'm not gonna go to the doctor this afternoon and have cancer, like, or heart disease, you know? Like, it just, it doesn't happen. Like, but in the market, anything could happen, right? Yeah, we, we get one comment and the market goes haywire. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Yeah, we, I love the statement, the market's an organic. It says like, well, to an extent, yes, it is an organic system. And uh, we see it ebb and flow and breathe, breath of the market. And uh, it, it's amazing how people uh, try to rationalize things from their backgrounds. Again, the, the doctor's answer, the, the engineer's answer, when it's just not there overall. So I agree with you. I mean, what I'm talking about is, you know, it's known as metacognition in the, in the scientific world. It's like we're thinking about thinking. And I'm asking people to essentially like rethink 
their thinking about markets and see it accurately both for what the game is and how their human brain actually interacts with that game. Because mm. it's not what they've been taught. It's like, you do have a facility to predict other people. You, your unconscious is using your emotions as information, so you might as well get conscious about it and being able to <laughs> choose which one means what so that you can act on the intuitive ones, the unconscious pattern recognition that you have gained through your education and experience and avoid acting on the ones that aren't about the market. Now, again, that's like a flat earth rounder thing. Like you have to decide, wait a minute, the earth is round and I can sail around it. Because that's what happens when you decide that your senses, feelings and emotions are information as opposed to something that should be controlled. You have gone from the earth is flat to the earth is around and you've opened up a whole new planet that you can explore and navigate and work within and ultimately become more successful. Oh man, I love it. All righty. Well, Michelle, I want to be respectful of your time. So only one final question for you here. And I would love to expand on this in another chat later on, but final question for you. What was the one mentor or book that just made you go, I want to get into the markets. This is what I want to do. What what was that moment oh. for you? Oh, well, that's now, actually a funny story. Ooh, I dated okay. I dated a former floor trader who had been on the options exchange for quite a few years. And he thought that I would be a good trader. And in fact, he tried to get me to buy a weather future seat at the Board of Trade. And I was like, weather futures seat, you guys taller than me. The answer is no. <laughs> so I happened to be with him in Chicago, walking down the South Street, turning left onto Jackson, when someone came running up to him and said, like, Don, 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 you've got to come trade upstairs, blah, 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 blah. And he looked at me and he goes, you should come. You're just writing that master's thesis. You should come. And so I did. He said to keep track of our P&L intraday because you didn't get intraday P&L in 94. And within a couple of months, I had my own account. But the, the moment that got me was back to what I said about momentum trading. It was one Friday afternoon that I was just watching the prices. I'd been there maybe three months. I don't know. And I noticed like Pfizer, Lilly, Shearing Plow, which was a drug stock. I don't know if they still exist. Um, started to all tick up together. And I called my trading desk manager and I said, there's something going on in the drug stocks. Like when he came over, he looked at my screen and said, yeah. And on Monday morning, there was some merger announced. I don't remember what it was. And they were all up like three bucks. <laughs> to which that guy said, my, my, the guy that ran the firm, he said, you have the best instincts I've ever seen. And I don't think a woman can trade. I was like, Bob, is that a compliment or not? <laughs> um, but like, that was the moment that I, like, I just knew I, whatever Don had talked about that he thought I would be good at, that was that incarnated, which then became what? Theory of mind. It became me sensing what was going on in the market and, and like predicting that these prices that were all moving in lockstep, I didn't know that's what it was till years later, at, you know, till till they did that experiment at Caltech. I didn't know that, but. Absolutely. I love that. That That's actually one of the more interesting ones I've heard overall. So where can people find you? Rethink Group? Uh, yeah, my website we is therethinkgroup.net. Um, I'm on Twitter is Denise, my middle initial K, S-H-U-L-L. Um, yeah. All right. That'll work. We'll make sure to get a share. Ms. Nice, thank you again for coming on. I look forward to the next one. And uh, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, let us know. And uh, we'll try to reach out and get those. But please go check out the uh, Intuition Brain Game on the Rethink uh, website there. And again, look forward to the next one. Thank you. And we'll see you. Thanks for having me. Take care.